So welcome to yet another session about interoperability. Um, <laughs> this one is really, really easy for me because all we did was collect abstracts in our abstract collection process. And we're gonna let them just do the talking. The donkey picture is not relevant. I just like it. Um, so my name is Bob, for those who haven't met me. Um, we have... Oh, just just click on it. Right, we've got a fairly packed program. We've got six presenters. Um, three of them are remote. Uh, the first three, but then the last three should be here. I hope by the end they should be here. <laughs> yeah, we have comfort. We have dung. I've seen dung somewhere. Vincent, are you with us? Oh, we have Vincent. All right, so we're all good. So we're going to start off doing doing the first three remotely. We hope it goes well. Um, if there's technical problems, if somebody's mic is not working or something like that, we'll probably just shift to the next one and let them come back. Um, so, yeah, welcome everybody, and particularly welcome to the to the six presenters. I, I think without further ado, we're going to kick off. We'll do the first three, see how much time we have for questions, and then do the next three. So, Mr. Mpazi from Lesotho, I'm going to stop sharing, and that should allow you to come in. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, am I audible? Hello, Bob, so can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity for having us. Um, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lebajram Pazi. Uh, I'm from Lesotho, a very small mountain kingdom that is completely surrounded by South Africa. And I work as a computer engineering lecturer at the National University of Lesotho. Uh, and as I'm- uh, Hello, Mr. Mpazi. Hello. We are not seeing your screen yet. Well, the screen is not- We hear, we hear you very well, your audio is working. Okay. Yes. Huh. Let, me, let me try again. And um, we can see the screen on the Zoom. Oh, we have it. We have it. Perfect. Okay, please carry on. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, thank you so much. So yeah, I was um, just introducing myself and I'm here with my colleague uh, from the National University of Lesotho, Mr. Hobata Stepemela. And um, we're actually working on a project for strengthening health information systems, which is actually funded by PEPFA at ICAP Lesotho. So we are going to share our recent efforts and successes towards uh, building a flexible and easy to use DHIS2 integration solution for uh, Lesotho's HMIS uh, ecosystem. So here we have a, an outline that actually shows uh, the roadmap for uh, my presentation. I'll first start off with the background, then talk about um, related works or solutions uh, in the space of DHIS2 integration. Proceed to talk about our design or the design of the customizations that we have proposed. Talk about the implementation, testing, conclusion, and then talk about um, recommendations for the future. All right, so firstly, let's talk about briefly about the a little background. So the Lesotho's health management information management system ecosystem currently covers 90% of health facilities nationally and is currently mainly used to manage HIV and TB programs. So in terms of data flow, uh, patient transactional data is captured from two main point of care systems which at the moment are actually um, 
OpenMRS, as well as uh, the pharmacy system, which has been implemented using ODO. And all of those systems, or those two systems, or those two point of care systems are actually accessible via uh, BAMNI, the BAMNI interface. And of course, um, uh, this uh, information uh, that is captured, be it clinical or at the pharmacy site, uh, is actually captured at facility level and is routinely pushed to the DHIS2 based national data warehouse uh, in aggregate format. And when it's on DHIS platform, then it uh, is used for analytics purposes. So the two currently supported point of care systems, as I've already explained, are actually dockerized as shown over here. And we are of course planning to have other point of care systems, for example, to digitize the lab component within um, the facility, which is going to be implemented using open LEs, as we hope. So yeah, that's a brief background. Now coming to the gap or the problem that we currently are facing with our ecosystem, to be specific, um, for us to push information from the point of care systems that I've already tried to explain at facility level to our data warehouse, which is implemented using DHIS2, we mainly use um, the OpenMRS DHIS connector module. And um, of course, we also have another solution that we have uh, adopted, which is the BAMNI DHIS2 um, integration app. And the main reason for that is because of the shortcomings of the DHIS2 connector module that I'll explain as I proceed with the presentation. But before I move on to that, maybe I should allude to the fact that the DHIS connector module is actually a quite a rich solution um, that is able to easily um, aggregate or actually uh, integrate uh, the, the point of care systems that we have, for example, the open MRS to DHIS2 so that we can easily submit uh, scheduled reports in a flexible manner uh, to the DHIS2 uh, uh, data warehouse. However, the DHIS2 connector module is actually tightly coupled to OpenMRS and there not be able to, cannot be used, or it's quite difficult for us to use it to, uh, to map data from other point of care systems. As an example, the pharmacy system that I said we've implemented using Odo, uh, we have actually hit um, you know, a, a wall in trying to, to achieve that, which actually led us to look at the BAMNI DHIS2 integration app, which is another solution which is quite flexible and supports easy mapping of data from multiple uh, different point of care systems. Um, so, but then however, uh, it's, it's still not yet mature and lacks some essential functionality. For example, uh, automated submission of scheduled reports is a problem on that side um, in the sense that uh, submission of reports when using the BAMNI DHS2 integration app, uh, it requires manual intervention. In other words, uh, the user actually has to log on to the BAMI system and then click a button to actually submit the information, which is quite uh, not practical for uh, the production system that we have comprising of over 100 facilities. Thus, our approach uh, was to enhance the BAMI DHS2 integration app to achieve a flexible and easy to use to integration solution for our HMIS context. Now coming to the aid and objectives of our um, uh, solution, the overarching aim of the project was to improve the DHS2 integration app uh, such that it can be able to flexibly allow us to submit information from multiple point of care systems to our data warehouse, which is implemented on DHS2. Uh, now moving on to the objectives, um, we have a number of objectives listed out here. Then I'll move on to the system requirements. So on this slide, we have a number of requirements that we thought are quite, were, were quite important for us to, uh, to look at in order to implement or address uh, the problem at hand. We have functional requirements as well as non-functional requirements. On the functional requirements side, we have the fact that we need to manage automation configurations for scheduled mapping of BAMNI reports to DHIS2 for various 
point of care systems, uh, manage scheduled mapping of BAMNI reports to DHIS2, and also manage log reports uh, for scheduled mapping of BAMNI reports to DHIS2. Whereas on the non-functional side, we have usability. Uh, the system needs to be usable enough for the users to, to find it easy to use the system. Um, we also have security on the non-functional part, as well as extensibility and uh, the fact that we need the, the, the solution to be performant. Now coming to related works or solutions that actually uh, do or partly do what it is that we want to achieve, which is um, uh, pushing information from our point of care systems to the data warehouse. We have the DHS2 connector module that I've already tried to uh, cover briefly in the previous slides. And as I've already mentioned, the main uh, weakness of the DHS2 connector module according to our context, it's that it's quite challenging to post reports from other point of care systems that we have. As I said, currently we have a point of care system that we are unable to use the DHS connector module with, which is uh, the pharmacy module, which has been implemented on order. And since in future, we're looking at prospects of also having a lab information system, which will be implemented using open LEs, it means we're still going to have a problem. Even though I have to allude to the fact that uh, it's quite a mature um, uh, application that is able to map uh, report for OpenMRS very, very well onto uh, the DHS. I'm about to say, you only have one minute to wrap up. A minute? Oh, sorry. Um, all right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, other than that, we have the DHS2 integration app, which I said we are going to modify to address the problem that we have. I guess I should, I should also go past that and come to our design. Now, on the, desi on the design of our solution, the main component uh, that we have, um, we have contributed is actually the scheduler daemon uh, onto the existing BAMNI DHS2 integration app as shown in the proposed system architecture diagram, whose main function is to automate the mapping of BAMNI reports, which would be either open MRS, pharmacy, you know, the lab information system, to DHIS2 accordingly, uh, according to the user-defined schedules. So several additional web application and web service and database enhancements have also been done uh, in order to support the functionality that is required. Now coming to the user interface, uh, this is the user interface that we have proposed that, that we, we hope will be quite user-friendly to our users. And of course, we have a number of tabs, as you can see over here, weekly, monthly, quarterly to support uh, different periods that can be uh, scheduled. We also come into the data model. These are the tables that we have proposed to, in, in order to support the functionality that we require. And moving on to the scheduling demo, which is the main contribution that we have done. Uh, this scheduling demo, all it does is to simply, you know, uh, check according to the defined schedules that the user will have defined that I want a certain report to be submitted, say weekly or monthly or quarterly or yearly, then it will simply check if that report is due. If the report is due, it will simply push it onto the DHIS um, to instance that we currently have as the data warehouse. Now coming to the implementation, we actually made use of uh, Scrum. Uh, because it enabled us to, 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 to be agile and also adapt uh, throughout the life cycle of the software development. Now coming to the tools, um, um, on the tools, we actually made use of a number of tools, but I would like to make a special reference to, 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 to particularly the DHS2 Web API, which we found to be quite useful, uh, that we actually make use of for us to post uh, the the data that we wish to push onto the DHIS2 instance, which is done, which is actually encoded within uh, a JSON payload as shown over here. And the endpoint that we actually made use of is shown over there, that it's the... Fazi, so I, I think we're gonna have to stop you there. It's fascinating. It's great to see the way the DHIS2 connector modules from OpenMRS have developed over the years. Um, I think people should be able to get hold of the presentation and go more into the detail. But at this point, I think we need to move on because we've got three to fit in in the next 40 okay. minutes. Thank you. Um, Tuzo, Tuzo, are you, are, are you with us? Yes, yes, uh, I can hear you and uh, I'm all set. 
Well, very good too. So you know we only have 10 minutes, so all right. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me know if you can uh, see my screen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, once again. Uh, my name is Tuzo, actually working with the uh, East Tanzania as a senior uh, information system advisor. Uh, I will be taking you uh, to the story of uh, how we managed to integrate uh, Tanzania immunization registry, uh, uh, which is acronymic and quality team. Uh, with the uh, with the DHS tool that has been used for quite some time. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> in my presentation, uh, I will be uh, going through these uh, four steps: uh, the introduction, the methodology that you have uh, we have used, but uh, the result that uh, has come up on the interoperability of these two systems. Uh, but as well as uh, the conclusion or the way forward uh, on where we are heading. So uh, introduction, actually, um, we have uh, this immunization information uh, system that was uh, digitized to actually collect uh, information, uh, but if, uh, which is uh, timely and uh, uh, it's actually being led by the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the program of the IVD. Uh, but before then, uh, we have this, uh, what we call them to her, to her tools, uh, that actually the, uh, the register that uh, each month need to be submitted in a DHS, which actually um, collect the same information, but uh, being in the aggregate form. Uh, but also uh, we have uh, another system called uh, VIMS that actually uh, pioneered the, uh, the chain of the vaccination uh, at the uh, program. Uh, which actually uh, uh, where the, the, this uh, immunization officer from district, they can request uh, the vaccine using that system, uh, but also at the end uh, provide uh, data in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the summary form in the ag form. So uh, the challenge that was there was uh, we have this uh, parallelism of the system uh, where you can see that the same uh, officer, health worker officer has to do uh, in both of the three systems, uh, has to actually uh, register in the two her tools that is currently uh, used to feed in the DHS tool, but also has to use the, uh, the team lead for registering uh, individual uh, children that has, has come to the facility to be immunized, but also uh, use the VIMS, uh, the, the system for uh, ordering uh, on the requesting uh, the vaccination commodity to the particular facility. So uh, that was kind of a burden uh, to, the, uh, to that healthy worker. So uh, the only goal was to uh, actually uh, make sure that we integrate those all three systems uh, where the team actually uh, had to communicate uh, with, uh, with the uh, vaccine information uh, uh, system uh, to kind of know the stock status of a given facility. And also uh, that uh, immunization registry uh, has to uh, vaccinate or has to record all of the information of the children that has been vaccinated. And then uh, at the end, it has to feed the aggregate information uh, to the DHS. So as you can see the structure here, uh, we have the data flow, the way how it is flowing uh, from the VIMS and then to the, uh, to the team and the way how team actually communicate with the VIMS to know the stock status before even the session of vaccinizing the, uh, the children has, has not started. But also at the end, in order to reduce the burden to the health worker who is actually doing all of that, uh, those uh, we need to get the aggregate information, uh, push it uh, uh, to, the, to the DHS too. So uh, we piloted, or we did this uh, for the uh, for the two uh, region, uh, which is actually uh, in Tanzania mainland, uh, which is Mwanza and, and the Kilimanjaro, uh, for them to go paperless so that they don't actually use the register again to fill those into our tools, which later uh, has to feed data into the into the DHS tool. So uh, after uh, integrating. Uh, we actually used the available API of the DHS2 
uh, to make sure that uh, the data uh, has to come from the uh, from the team uh, to the DHS two at the end of the uh, at the end of the month. So uh, with that being done, as you can see, uh, the DHS two now uh, with the, its capability of analytical tools, uh, the the uh, the data manager or the the uh, the manager at at the level of uh, of decision makers, they can use uh, the DHS two together with the other information that are already existing in the DHS two to make uh, a kind of report that can help them in their uh, in decision. So uh, the success part of it of the result was that uh, uh, we have first you have reduced the burden. Uh, of the health workers to make sure that uh, they don't feel uh, the paper and then let aggregate or summarize them to the DHS2. Uh, but also uh, we have reduced of, uh, instead of having many system uh, that the health worker has to, uh, to interact with, they can just interact with the only one uh, team, the registration, uh, the registration uh, system. And then at the end, those information will be uh, pushed to the uh, to the DHS2, and then which makes uh, those decision makers be able to get the data uh, on time, uh, since uh, the, the system and the system will be kind of uh, communicating. So that's what has been uh, done. Uh, but as I said, uh, this has been piloted for uh, for two uh, for two regions, uh, which is actually doing good. And uh, uh, as of now, uh, the plan that is there. Uh, in that uh, we need to scale up to the rest of the region. We have actually uh, 26 regions. Uh, so, and they have piloted for these uh, two regions. So the remaining work is to make sure that uh, uh, we scale up the, 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 this initiative to the rest of the, uh, to the, rest of the, uh, of the region. So uh, another thing is that uh, we are capacitating the user uh, to make sure that uh, even the uh, health workers, uh, they just not only use the team, but also they can use the DHS too in, uh, in identifying or checking the gaps of the data that has been submitted between the two systems, but also can help them in the, in the planning uh, or in making their uh, monthly planning or quarterly planning uh, when they are uh, planning for the, uh, for, 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 uh, for, uh, for surfacing for uh, of, of a, uh, a service delivered at, at the facility. So actually this is actually uh, going uh, to make sure that uh, health workers, uh, they actually uh, be able to interact with the DHS2 uh, to get the analytical data of what uh, they have been captured uh, using their uh, immunization uh, uh, registry. Yeah, thank you, uh, that's it. And uh, welcome for the question. Thanks very much Tuzo. And good to see you highlighting the, 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 the role of this interoperability to improve the, the work of health workers, um, which is what it's about. We said we were going to collect questions at the end of the three online presentations. So if you don't mind unsharing at this point, we get Mahmoud Al to come in. But don't go away. Hello. Yes, I'm here, Mahmoud. Hello, Mahmoud. Welcome. You can share your screen and go. Okay, thank you. Let me try to share and then you let me know whether you can see my screen. Share. We see Do it. you see a PowerPoint? Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening to our participants in Oslo and uh, in the Zoom meetings. So I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to uh, share with uh, all of you the, our interoperability uh, experience, how we improve the, the performance of the interoperability in Democratic Republic of Congo. So I am the managing director of Softworks. We worked in this, in this project. So only a brief about my company. We were established in 2007 in Bangladesh. We have around 22 staff. Majority of work, as you have seen, we have been working in the health sector for quite some time and uh, in the DHIS2 platform. We have been working for more than five years in Burkina Faso, Benin, Botswana, DRC, and Mali. 
So these, uh, I mean, this map shows uh, the areas where uh, our information systems have been implemented in. And uh, I will only focus on the, yeah, the DRC work uh, as of today, as of this uh, discussion. So I'm moving to the next one. So the, it's about interoperability. So it's about interoperability of DHIS2 with an external logistics management information system, which is called InfoMed RDC, which is used in DRC as you uh, all have understood now. So the system was developed using USAID funding uh, and uh, under a project, which is the Global Health Supply Chain Project, um, yeah, the Francophone Task Order and my company Softworks worked uh, to develop the thing. So what InfoMed do is uh, that entry form, the data entry formats of LMIS and some patient reporting is in DHIS2. So what InfoMed does is it periodically collects those data. And then there are some other data collection points in InfoMed. Then all of these data are used for different visualizations and dashboards like that. Little brief timeline of how it is developed. Uh, we developed the system in 2000, uh, at the end of 2018 and it was launched from uh, mid 2019. And the patient reports came a little later. I mean, uh, importing of patient reports, in fact. Then there were admin trainings and national rollout trainings like that. And then uh, it is still being maintained uh, until September 2022 under our support services. Very quickly on how data is transferred, if I can take the little pointer a little. So the the facilities who are very far, actually not in the, uh, so at the lowest level, they submit paper reports to the districts. You can say these are districts. Then the district staff, they have computers, so they enter the data in DHS2, the monthly LMS reports. There are you know, district warehouses and there are cent uh, I mean, the central warehouse, regional warehouses. They also enter data directly to the DHS2 of their LMS report. And there are other sources of data as well. So all of these data are periodically sent to that InfoMed platform where data visualization happens. So this is a typical view of the uh, LMIS data entry page for health facilities in DHIS2. So it has uh, the, I mean, I mean, some fields related to uh, the stock management, as you see the opening balance, receive, issue, dispensing like that. Uh, then there is, a, this is a view of a typical national dashboard uh, in InfoMed, sorry. Okay, now let's come to the main uh, focus about our interoperability experience. So initially to transfer data from DHIS2 to the InfoMed platform, we were using the data value sets API and we were using the JSON endpoint because it is easy and it's uh, I mean, easy to manage and then it's uh, when field names are there and easy to handle like that. Just to give you an uh, understanding of the, of, of the numbers. So in DRC DHIS2, there is uh, more than 20,000 health facilities. And in the LMIS entry form, there are actually 114 products. Uh, if we represent it in DHS2 terms, uh, it's elements and category combinations. So there are 1,596 of that. And some patient category combinations, 68, we do also need for some reports. So the maximum data points for a specific month can reach it will not reach to that definitely, it has not reached, but it can be 33 million data points that can transfer from DHIS2 to, to InfoMed. So this is a typical view of how the, the JSON data looks. So what we found uh, that this is uh, too much data. When I say too much data means uh, the volume of data every hour was so much that we had to uh, improve. So the first improvement, what we did, we transferred from JSON to CSV. The data value sets API, we said, okay, we do not want to do it using JSON, let's do it with CSV. As an example, this is a case of example of all data that came to May. And you can see the chart on the right side, uh, actually by date. So you can see here that on the 10th of May, 
on that day maximum hourly data it's i mean one hours of data 491 megabytes data was transferred only at one hour and it had 4.76 million data values and the total data that came was 4.58 gigabytes so you uh, understand so when we moved to csv we reduced the data burden to 62 percent but that was not still enough because of the data that was coming in so then we had to do a second improvement so what we did was uh, in our software terms we call it queue management system means we do not just execute the software we have to do some management of it uh, you know as a as a bank queue as we go to the bank there are queue and then the teller serves us sequentially right like that so from dhis2 we get the data in csv but then we do not run or execute every data point we transform that data point so this is the typical data that is coming in from the dhis2 so we re read that in the software and then we change it to sql commands because the other system it is based on uh, i mean um, i mean sql database so we transform this data to sql commands so that number of uh, number of executions are reduced then i try to simplify this this is the simplest i can make so okay then we hand it over to this queue manager what it does is we have different types of data right we have the lms data from health facilities we have data from warehouses we have patient data so in the rabbit mq as they call the queue management system it has different queues means like a bank's queue so we hand over data to these queues sequentially so it goes in every queue data is coming in and it's asynchronous then what happens is there are consumer processes that runs parallelly and then they take the the first one from this queue and executes and pushes the data into the informat so all these five in a way in simplest terms they execute the things parallelly without putting burden on the system cpu as like you know previously there were millions of points coming through but they take one by one after the first one executes it goes there then it takes the second one until it doesn't finish it doesn't take the second one so the the I mean, the load on the server is always maintained it will never go up to like you know a millions of data and the server bogs down it it, it doesn't happen in this scenario so this is how we manage to uh, you know release the server's resources uh, in terms of millions of data as it comes through we pass it through the rabbit mq manage queue management process and uh, then it has improved our system so this is just a typical view of where you can come and say okay how many how many data point is there now under processing like that and then some challenges uh, so the the I mean, when you want to get data from an external system to uh, from DHS2 to an external system, you definitely need to map the facilities, and you also need to map the element category combinations with the products in an external system. We did that. The keeping sync of the facility catalog sometimes is a challenge uh, because of the of the number of facilities. As you understand, there are a lot of facilities coming in every month and uh, going out, stopping like that sometimes the sync stops that creates issues and you have to uh, check whether the rabbit mq process has stopped or not then uh, the queue we have to we had to use sequential blocking queue so that uh, if there is any issue we can stop and give an error an email is automatically sent to the administrator like that there were some issues with the csv files like uh, the the csv file from dhis2 is not fixed column it has varying number of columns so we had to handle that and if there are remarks in the data set then it sometimes break the csv we also had to handle that so that's from my side uh, later i guess we can take some questions so as i went i guess a little too fast <laughs> okay thank you mambo you are perfect thanks but thanks very very much for sticking to the time i know it's really tight uh, it's really nice to see a presentation about performance because often it's when you do interoperability that you realize things work a bit faster than when people are clicking on the user interface. Um, we've got five minutes, which is not a lot of time. Anybody quickly want to address something, comment something to one of the speakers? Do we, 
So what do we need to do something, do something with the mics? Will you run the stairs or you want me to run the stairs? Oh, up the top, it's Claude. Oh, okay. She's switching me off. Uh, hi, uh, so I have a question actually about the data volume. Um, so originally it was in JSON, yeah? And then you changed it to CSV because uh, the JSON was taking up too much bandwidth, too much, I think, space in, uh, in memory. But uh, I don't know, I, I mean, would have pagination solved that problem or I, I, or is, is there, was there another reason why JSON was suited? Yeah, okay, can I answer that now? Please do, Mohamed. Yeah, sure. So it's not about pagination, you see, it's every hour we need all the data that had been entered into the DHIS2 platform on those uh, data sets. Yeah, if we do it using pagination, then you, we had to keep the process running, like, you know, every 100 records, and then we get the next page, we execute, get the, the next page, Rather than that, I mean, sometimes we found that it overlaps with the next hour thing because there is too much data, as you have seen, like there are sometimes millions of data points. So even if we take 100, it would be 20,000 iterations executing it and then taking the next page. So overlap happened initially. That's why we had to reduce the load of the data volume which has transferred we take the total data and then as i said we convert it to a to number of uh, i mean sql commands which are less for that okay thanks thanks Mohamed. i think there's a lot of technical detail that okay we probably could dig more into okay, thanks. Um, but i just want to say is there any question or remark somebody wants to make about one of the other two presentations if not, we come back and interrogate you more. Tuzo with his immunization register and the DHIS2 connector module in the suit. No, otherwise, I think uh, all I can do is thank the the three presenters who come in from outside, it's always a bit awkward. Um, I hope you didn't feel too far away from us. we we'll give you a, a warm hand for the three of you. And let's move to who we have here. Vincent, I think you're on. I'll see if I can get your presentation up. Okay, just get this code, please. Drag it into there. Right, let's be sure our screen. Right, bridge. And you're good to go. Mike is on. Thanks, Vincent. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Seems like uh, we are we are too full, huh? Yeah. So my name is Vincent Minde. I'm a lead software developer at the University of Daslam DHS2 Lab in Tanzania, uh, and I will be presenting a case for eye care. You see, eye care or integrated care. Yeah, it's basically a hospital uh, management information system that we developed at the University of Islam. Now I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to move around a little bit fast. And here I just wanted to give a little bit of history on how we're involved in a lot of, in the process of, you know, uh, implementing some of the uh, hospital systems in Tanzania or EMR systems in Tanzania. 
So we are involved in some of the systems in design as the University of Islam. We're involved in a deployment of some other system called Afyakea, which was based in Bami and things like that. Uh, we also managed to deploy a laboratory uh, module on top of basically a laboratory system on top of uh, OpenMRS or on top of BAMI, for those who know BAMI. Yeah, and during all of that deployment, uh, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, truth is we can't go through them all right now, but I'll just mention a few. Uh, one was the, uh, well, there were challenges, but there were motivations to us. Uh, by the way, we're innovation, we're an innovation uh, lab, so we like to innovate. So there were sort of motivations in a way. Uh, number one was DHS2 integration. Most of the EMRs that were being created really didn't have any integration to DHS2. And one problem we face is that after an EMR has been implemented, let's say in a facility, then they, you start realizing that they are not very much frequent in reporting data into DHS2. So that was a very big problem. Like somebody would just ask, okay, we already have the system. Why do we need to go into DHS2 again? Why don't they just you know, talk to each other? and things like that. And this actually has been a very big problem in Tanzania. To a point, even a ministry member once mentioned, ah, maybe in three years, people may not be using DHS2 anyway. So to us, it was a motivation to change things. Uh, of course, there were other uh, challenges, uh, you know, deployment issues, architectural issues, code fragmentation, user experience, all of that. Uh, I don't want to get so much into that. That could be a session of its own. Uh, if you have time, maybe we can talk in private. Uh, but yeah, we, we sort of set out to solve these challenges uh, in all different ways. And for the purpose of this uh, session, I'm only going to concentrate on the DHS2 integration. Uh, so we sort of came up with a new framework. Uh, well, given all of those challenges first, we sort of went down into the mud and created a new EMR, let's say uh, uh, a new hospital system. And it is based on open MRS. And with that, we also figured we'd have to add the integration module because it was sort of the most important part on our end in terms of uh, you know, reporting data into DHIS2. And so we went through the process of, you know, developing the EMR, uh, following a certain set of journeys. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, and in a nutshell, you know, the EMR contains, you know, a patient journey. Uh, the expectation is when a patient comes, he, he goes through a certain process of consultation and all of that. Uh, in our case in Tanzania, they go through a process of registration, building, consultation, laboratory, pharmacy, and, you know, things can move around in that manner, depending on, you know, the, the case itself, whether it's in patient or out patient, but our design was basically uh, around that. And for the most part, uh, we managed to sort of come up with a new design to address all of these issues. And in our design, we sort of chose OpenMRS as one of the DGD uh, term they use nowadays. <laughs> Uh, we used OpenMRS and sort of created a module on top of OpenMRS. And as you can see, there is a bunch of things there, you know, MySQL, all of that. All of those are still too big to, to talk about right here. They require sessions of their own. But I would like to concentrate so much on the DHS2 integration. There is where I think this session is most probably all about. Uh, so our idea of innovation is sort of... Uh, if you've ever heard the term KISS, uh, keep it simple. Uh, we like to keep things simple. So whatever we design, whatever we put through, we, we make it so simple such that uh, it's easy, you know, for whether it's the user to use or anybody who is trying to use it to sort of get a feel of it without any issues. And one of the problems that we faced when we were integrating systems, because we were, we were also involved in integration of multiple other EMR systems to BHS2, is the fact that people don't even people don't know much about the DHS2 API. So you face a lot of challenges when you are trying to know, for them to understand how DHS2 works, uh, share them with the APIs, you know, things like that. It was sort of a challenge. So you know, sometimes we end up creating mediators in the middle where we give them a data structure that is a little bit understandable to them, and then maybe from there now you can trans 
extrapolate, you can extrapolate that and, you know, uh, you know, work uh, in that manner. But also that brings a lot, a lot of other challenges, you know, like if things change in their system, uh, all of things that, so many things that could go wrong, that would make it uh, problematic to sort of address that structure that you have created. So what we decided to do is sort of within the EMR that we created, uh, the integration module sort of works in a way that uh, it, it relieves the user from knowing the intricacies of DHIS2 in a way. So what it does first, uh, the tool downloads the, the metadata from DHS2. Presumably if you have a DHS2 instance, you probably have an aggregate form uh, with its design and all of that. So the idea is the tool downloads that metadata and then displays the form to the user. And then now it's up to the, you know, whether it's the developer of the system or it's the, uh, you know, the system administrator of the system, who knows what the data is all about. It's up to them now to perform a mapping of each individual data element to their database. So essentially they say this data element and category option has, this is the SQL that is going to fetch that data. As simple as that. They only need to know what data is needed and the SQL they need to write to sort of extrapolate that data. And then the tool will take it from there. It will just, you know, pull the database on the SQL that, of the mapping that has been made. And then from there now it will send the data all the way to DHIS2. So in a way, we relieve the people who want to, uh, to sort of uh, perform any mapping. Uh, uh, and one of the tools we actually looked was the OpenMRS. Uh, there is a tool for integration, uh, OpenMRS and DHS2. Uh, and the problem with that was, the, you know, transform, transforming the, the architecture of OpenMRS didn't really cover every type of data that is needed in our DHS2 instance. So it was better to sort of go the SQL way. Yeah, so basically that is the basic design that we chose to go through and so far it's been working for us. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I still have one minute, 37 seconds. Oh, what was I? <laughs> yeah, anyway, anyway the, uh, but the juicy part, I think the juicy part is over. I mean, what uh, the next slide here was just how we went about deploying the system into the hospital uh, systems. You know, here is where we're providing the training and the capacity building. Uh, yeah, and finally, we are planning to create sort of an ecosystem around it. Uh, we have deployed the EMR in, in about two facilities and we are way innovative. So we sort of uh, try to, uh, to sort of add features and roll them back if they don't work. So we move fast in, in a way to sort of uh, make sure we're not creating something that cannot be used or something like that. So we are trying to create an ecosystem around other stakeholders, the Ministry of Health, facility levels, the university community in terms of research and things like that, but also the open source community. We haven't yet open sourced it, but it's in the way to, to, to sort of open source. And just on another point, uh, <laughs> all right, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, anyway, I think that's, that's it. Asante san. <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks, thanks very, very much, Vincent. Sorry for dragging you off. <laughs> I mean, the innovations coming out of these guys at UDSM is quite incredible. We could, we could do a whole session just on UDSM innovation. We need to share your screen, Dun. No, no, we have to do it from what's on here. Um, Oh, Vincent, we could have left you here. Where is it gone? Ah. That's wrong. I feel so bad, Vincent. I've stolen a minute and a half, which you could have helped. Doom. <laughs> right. Ah. Share, share, share.
Slideshow. Oh, slideshow, slideshow. Yeah. Speak shit. Okay, yes. Start no, no, we have an agreement. It's 1354. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. My name is Yong from uh, His Vietnam. I with my colleagues here with John and Sam. So today we are very happy to introduce to you one example for the interoperability and the innovation innovation we did for Laupedia COVID-19 and uh, EHI2. Okay, so let's have a sorry let's have a bit of the background that we are currently having in Laos. so we have a case by surveillance and a vaccination registry uh, this act uh, we took it from the tracker metadata packages so nothing is special for this one so uh, we have more things that i'm going to focus on my presentation today the first one is the vaccination pre-registration and the national uh, certificate vaccination certificate and uh, vaccine certificate for travel and uh, the mobile app. Okay, so let's move to the first one, the pre-registration for vaccination. So what is this system? So the system is, uh, is one uh, online web system where people can uh, go there and book for their appointment in advance. Okay, so, and why do we have this system? So by the time Lao start the vaccination campaign, so many, many people came to the vaccination site that, was a very big crowd. So um, that's called the chaos, okay? So, uh, and then there were lack of the health worker who do the data collection. So by having the pre-registration system, we can reduce the pressure for the vaccination site and also for the health worker, okay? So uh, uh, why I'm saying that because the, when the people do the pre-registration, they can enter the personal information by themselves. So the health worker don't have to enter those data. Before that, the health worker need to enter every data from the person. Okay. So and uh, what's, what's the risk system contain? So it has three components. The first one is the DHI2 instance. The second one, uh, DHI2 is done with some customized app. We have multiple customized app to implement the system. Uh, the next one is we have the one uh, customized service, middle service, a customized backend. So to uh, connect the data from DHI2 to the uh, public portal and also for the certificate. And the last one is the one uh, online public portal. So I will move to the next one. So I think this is the most important slide for today's presentation. So we have the graphs on how the whole system works. So you can see on the left-hand side, the blue one, we have the DHI2 instance, which is running on version 2.35. And in there, we have the vaccination uh, program and uh, some customized app for the pre-registration system and also the national certificate and the travel certificate. On the right-hand side, the orange one, that is the public portal, which have the address of vaccinate.la and the mobile app is working the same way, okay? So in this public portal, any people can uh, access to uh, this one to do the pre-registration or to generate the certificate or request for the travel certificate. Okay, so uh, in the middle, you have you see the green one. This is the most important part in the, in this uh, in this graph. So we have the middle middle service to connect the data from the HI to to the public portal, and also get the data from the HI to to generate the certificate for the clients. Okay, so then why do we have this middle system? Because from the public portal or from the mobile app, we can request for the data directly from the HI2, but it's not recommended because if we do like that, there will be some chance that our some sensitive detail will be exposed to the public, for example, like the HI2 URL or username or the password. So that's why we have this middle system. And one more thing about this middle system is we also have the signing and verify uh, service, which is used for the QR code. I will talk about it later. So, okay, let's, oh, sorry. 
Let's put uh, let, let go to the previous one. So you have, I have some screenshots on the pre-registration system. So the first screenshot uh, on the top is uh, where the people can go there and input uh, their detailed information. And then on the next screenshot on the right is where people can pick their vaccination site and then uh, pick the appropriate date. And the last one, people can pick the appropriate time slot because we divide the time slot in uh, one day because we don't want many, many, many people to come to the vaccination at the same time. So that's why we have the time slots. Okay, so, and then they submit it. So after the submission, we have the third screenshot there. Uh, this is the pre-registration receipt. In there, we have one QR code. And uh, this is a very simple QR code. That QR code is for when, pe uh, when people finish the submission, they will take a screenshot of that receipt and then they come to the vaccination site, they will show that QR code to the health worker and the health worker use the tablet with the HR2 on it, with the customized app, and they will scan that QR code and then can enter the data directly uh, for that people, okay? So that's all for the pre-registration system. So I will move to the national certificate. So national certificate is the proof of vaccination. Then people can use this one to join the public activity like school, hospital, restaurant, and uh, something else. So in the national certificate, we have the personal information and vaccination data. And the last one is a QR code. Okay, there are two types of uh, national certificate. There's a hard copy and digital copy. For the hard copy, uh, people, when they go to the vaccination site, the health worker will print the hard copy of the certificate inside the HIA2. Okay? So that you can see the journey for the hard copy. And for the digital copy, people will use the mobile app. So they just uh, go to the App Store. It will work with both Android and iOS. They go to the App Store, download the app and then input the personal information and you will get the certificate. Okay, so this is a screenshot on how the certificate look like. We have some uh, personal information, the vaccination data, and the screenshot on the right is the functionalities in our custom map is to print the, the national certificate. You can print either print only the first door or print only the second doors or print the QR code only something like that. Yeah, this is some screenshot uh, for our mobile app. So uh, people can input the personal information and you see the third and the fourth screenshot is inside the mobile app. You have the green background. So that means people fully vaccinated. If you got only one dose and that will be in yellow color. Okay. and. Uh, Last screenshot is people use the mobile app to verify the QR code. I will talk about it, it later. So, and the uh, last one is the vaccine, vaccine certificate for travel. So this is very similar to the national certificate, but we can use this one internationally. So um, in the vaccine certificate for travel, we have um, something like the national certificate, including the personal information and uh, something else like passport number, passport date of issue and uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and a QR code. So, so how people can, how people can request for a travel certificate? They will go to the public portal, request for the certificate and we will have a team, the health worker team to verify to verify their request. Uh, there are two ways to for one people to get the travel certificate, which is, which are, first they will come to the, uh, the pickup site and pick it, or we have the email response. The certificate will be sent via email to the person. Yeah, I have some screenshot here. On the right hand side is the list of on the request form uh, from the people. On the left hand side here, when you uh, when the health worker want to verify for one person, they will click on verify button and we will have 
uh, this screenshot if all the information is okay and then the hand worker will click on verify and generate so when you click on generate uh, the the travel certificate will be printed in the hard copy and uh, if people choose to uh, get the internet uh, sorry travel certificate by email the, and the email will be sent in this step okay this is how the travel certificate look like okay let me talk let me let me explain a bit on the the, 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 the QR code so the our QR code is the cryptographically QR code and that cannot be cannot be fake and how do we generate this QR code we use a combination of keys the first keys is the private keys and the second keys is the public key so the private key will be used to generate the QR code and the public key will be used to verify the QR code. So for the private key, we don't give it to anyone else. That is a top secret key. If we give the private key to anyone, then everyone can fake our QR code. So the private key uh, will be stored securely in our server. So for the public key, public key is you for the verification. We can give it to any organization who want to scan our QR code. For example, we can give the public key to the organization within uh, Southeast Asia country and they have their own verification and they will use that to scan our QR code. And uh, one more way to verify our QR code is to use the public portal or use the mobile app that also have the verification functionality. Yeah, so... Yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. So Mona's making me feel very bad now. I thought we had 90 minutes, but we have two hours. So I've been bullying everybody for nothing. <laughs> no, we have more time. I can bring everybody back. <laughs> now my only worry now is if I put Vincent on the stage and he knows he's got so long. Well, I think, I think we can have a good bit of discussion afterwards. Um, um, the, the, the QR code that, that they did in, in, in his Vietnam, for example, is actually very interesting in terms of the standards that were used. It's based on the EU, the EU specification that was released. It's very nice. Um, yeah, comfort. What I should do is invite you up while I just get your slides up. Oops. This one. Yeah, I left it on this moment. Now, Vincent, you I feel really bad for. Because I pushed you off. <laughs> and I didn't need to. I'm sorry. Oh, you're there. Yeah. All right, good. So, Simone, if I hear you, we have until three. All right, comfort. Take your time. Uh, yeah. It would be fair to others. <laughs> Not really. But you have, like, okay, let's go till about, you can have about 15, 20 minutes. Oh, okay. And then maybe we can bring the other guys back up. He hasn't fled. Where is Dung gone? Oh, no, he's just moved back. After, after Comfort has finished his presentation, maybe Vincent, if you don't mind, and Dung, 
you can come and join us back up here and let's have a bit of chat. All right, you know how the mic is working? Uh, no. I've just, just talked to that. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Okay, that's great. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Comfort Manka. I'm with uh, His South Africa. So today I'll be talking about uh, interoperability work that we've done on uh, the HRIS project that we're working on in South Africa. So this is the outline of our presentation. So I'll just give you a brief overview of you know where we come from with this. And then I'll present the architecture, like where we started, and then the lesson we learned from where we started and the current you know, update that we've made on the architecture. And then we'll also talk about the next steps. So we work with the National Department of Health in South Africa, and there's Human Resources for Health Strategy 2030. And uh, we use that as a guide um, in implementing uh, this, this solution. And with the HRIS or HRH system, uh, there are questions that uh, we're trying to answer, I mean, for, for the ministry. Like, you know, uh, where are the health workers and how many nurses do we have? How many medi me uh, medical you know, practitioners? Can we work out uh, how many nurses will need uh, in 2030 to achieve universal health, health coverage. So basically, these are some of the questions that we try to answer with the, uh, with the HRIS uh, uh, system. So the HRIS system has uh, four components uh, or products that we managed to, to, to build. So the first one is the registry. So we are using Happy, Happy Server. So it's a fire registry, that is where all the health care worker records are. And we use DHIS2 as our data warehouse. And we also have like the HRH portal. So the portal right now is a DHIS app that we installed on the, the HR, HR, HR warehouse uh, uh, DHIS instance. And we have, we also have like the, 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 HRH, you know, planner module. I mean, we started with the, you know, basic one, and then we are moving into, you know, machine learning as we as we get more data to uh, to be able to uh, do predictions. So these are the components as I've, I've I've already highlighted. This is the architecture that we started with. Um, like I said, th these are the, the data sources. We get data from the PESAL system. PESAL system is a system that is used by the ministry uh, to, uh, to store data on you know, all the uh, government employees. But our focus mainly is, uh, is on health workers. And then we have HPCSA. These are our councils for, for doctors, dentists, and et cetera. And then we have also nursing council and the pharmacy council. And we also get data from municipalities, that's data that is not on PESAL, and also get data from the private sector. Okay, other data that we use uh, or other sources are the DHIS2. It's just for, you know, for the routine, uh, routine data. And we also get data from the, you know, the MFL. And like I had uh, said uh, 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 earlier, I mean, we, we also have the the okay the registry. So basically, we get the data from from the sources. We are using OpenHIM as the interoperability layer, and then you know we push the data to the I mean to the warehouse. I'll 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 go into detail uh, when when I talk about the the update that we have made. I mean, looking at the different components. Okay, and the portal the, the portal. I mean, I've mentioned earlier. I mean, this is uh, where the the ministry. Goes, I mean, to to look at the the data, to look at you know who's where, look at you know the the number of health health workers in different uh, in different categories, and we also uh, have built uh, mediators to allow uh, 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 
the, the COVID uh, system to access data from the, from the registry. And even for vaccination, uh, uh, they also get data from the, uh, from the registry. I mean, what we learned with the initial architecture was that uh, we didn't have uh, you know, flexibility and to make changes, it was taking us a bit of time. And then the aggregation process as well was taking us time. And, and again, in the warehouse to track back, like if the, the, the users want to know the, the, the records, the individual records that led to the aggregate number, we had a, you know, a, challenge, a challenge with that. And we also learned that the fire registry is a, is a new, uh, uh, or the fire rather, is a new standard. And uh, we still have a lot of systems that, are, uh, that can communicate uh, using the fire, the fire standard. Okay, this is the, the architecture update that we, we had to make. So I'll, I'll go into deep details now, just looking at the different components. So with the data sources, I mean, they are, they are still the same. I mean, we get uh, data from uh, the PESAL, the, the councils and, and private sector. And we also still use the, the MFL and get data from DHIS2 routine uh, system. And then what we did like with the update, we introduced uh, what we call the dimensional model uh, uh, data lake there. So basically instead of pushing the aggregated data directly to DHIS2, so what we've done, we've introduced this middle piece uh, to we push data from the ETL to, to there. And from there, we, we push that same data or the aggregated data Rather, we do an aggregation in the dimensional model and we push that to, to DHIS2. And we also push the individual records to, uh, to the, fire, uh, the fire registry. And we have also added the component for the machine learning because we've got the raw data in there, we've got the aggregate data. So we can do that uh, in there. Okay. So in terms of the, the portal, or the, the visualization, we, we still have uh, our dashboards on DHIS2, and then we still have the, the web portal. So that's where we do our visualizations. And then we are uh, trying to introduce uh, advanced you know, uh, soft uh, BI2. Uh, uh, right now we are experimenting with, uh, with uh, Superset. Uh, we, try, we started with Power BI, but uh, we had issues like with license, especially for our, our, you know, our, our, uh, our clients, uh, the Ministry of Health. So we, we're now trying to use a superset to do our, our advanced analytics. So this is the full architecture. So the only big change uh, is with the introduction of the dimensional data, data model. So, so yeah, this is really, uh, uh, improved, uh, but I'll, I'll just touch, touch on that in the, the next slide, you know, what benefits we got from the, from the change. And with the current architecture, we are using the fire standard and we're using the, you know, the, the happy server trying to use open software for this. And we currently support the mobile care services, the discovery, and then for aggregated data. And, you know, we're trying to uh, use ADX um, as well to, uh, to so to yeah to support uh, that standard and and uh, HPD uh, as well. So we're trying to use as, as like open standards uh, as much as we can. And like with the update, uh, the benefits that we are we are seeing so far, uh, we've noticed that the, the if you make a change to the uh, the data or you introduce new data elements or or new variables that you want to report on, uh, it's easier to, to do that now. And then the queries are more optimized. And then the machine learning capability, we added that. And also the, uh, the, the tracking back to where the source data is or the, the raw data, you, you are able to, to do that. And uh, also advanced analytics we're doing in the, in the previous architecture, but, but yeah, still doing, that here. 
So in terms of HRIS uh, in, in South Africa and the project that we're working on, I mean, there are uh, advances that we are looking at, uh, like we are introducing machine learning and, you know, predictive analytics, and then the, uh, you know, the planning module, and as I reported earlier, uh, we're trying to use, uh, you know, BI tools uh, as well uh, for advanced reporting. And yeah, I would like to thank you know the, the team that worked on the project and uh, and and Pepfa. Okay, this is uh, information about uh, his South Africa. So thanks everyone. Thanks. Um, Daniel, you were very good. You stopped me with ten minutes. Oh, okay. I told everybody they had 10 minutes. And in fact, you have more. Tinja, you know what I was saying this morning about architecture and fashion? And I look at that diagram. It's like everything that's in fashion is on that diagram. Fire repositories, API mesh gateways. All right. So, yeah, sorry for cutting everybody short, particularly Vincent, who I cut shorter than I should. Um, well, I think what I want to invite you, Vincent and Comfort and Dung, to come back up um, and have a reasonable opportunity to get properly grilled by people who want to ask questions. We actually have half an hour. If we, we have more than half an hour. We've been too good at this. And I think the three guys are online, Tuzo, Mahmoud and Patsy, I think you're all there still. Yeah, we are here. Are we allowed to comment online? Can you hear us? Is that Ranga? Yes, it's Ranga. Who let you in? <laughs> I don't know. You don't have <laughs> much security. <laughs> yeah, please, Ranga, go ahead and make a comment. Welcome. I saw something about MPSD, the Mobile Care Services Directory. Can you get a, a bit of explanation on how it's implemented? Thank I think that was to you. Yeah, that was the MCSD. Oh. Uh, who, who asked the question? Sorry. That is Ranga from Zimbabwe. Okay. I, Ranga, like we. We are using the like the happy, happy, you know, happy fire, right? And then it has uh, uh, resources, you know, that we are using. We are using the 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 the, the location, and then we are using the the uh, practitioner resource and practitioner role, and those comply to the IHE, you know, uh, MCSD uh, standard. So that's basically how we are we're currently using it. So, okay, because when, when yeah, I'm thinking that you can spec specify the services that, that are being given by specific facilities, right? This is what I'm thinking. So is it like possible to see which services are available in which facility? Or am I misunderstanding what MCSD is in this implementation? I mean, you, you'd be able to, uh, like if you, Query locations. I mean, you'd be able to see, or oh, like, yeah, you'd be able to see uh, the services that are that are being offered. Or unless if I'm not misunderstanding the the question. Yeah, I think so. Ranga, maybe on the on the, the actual detail, you might have to come back to comfort afterwards. But uh, yeah, you know, M MCSD, you've got both locations and you've got the services. services. In fact, the, the original. Original CSD even had schedules, if I remember correctly, for appointments and the like. But thanks, Raga. Um, maybe you can follow up after with Comfort. Um, okay, thank you very much. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you. Here's a question from the back. Ah. Where's the mic? Alexa, who can help you? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Um, thank you all. It was really fantastic to hear how your approaches to the solutions and thank you so much for sharing. Um, I have two questions, one directed at comfort using open him. Um, I was curious if you used uh, a mediator from the open him library if you all developed a custom mediator to achieve your solution and whether the ETL automation that you showed in your diagram was part of that mediator or if that was handled by a separate platform. Okay, for the mediator, uh, for sharing data with the, the COVID system that we showed, we, we developed a node, you know, a, a mediator in, in Node.js, and then we just installed that on, on OpenHIM. And then for, the sorry? Is it in the library now? Oh, no, it's not in the library. It's, it's a custom one that we, we developed and then, and then and set up or op uh, installed on OpenHIM. Gotcha. So it's not in the, like, yeah, so it's not in the library yet. Okay. Yeah, maybe something that we, if you know others want the similar thing, maybe something that we can push to the library, but it's not there yet. Okay. Yeah. And Thank for the, the ETL tool, we're using we're using Airflow, right? So it's handled by by C42, but but for the data, it's just a pass through the open human. But 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 the processing and everything is done through the through Airflow. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So processing through Airflow and then routing it through the custom yes, theater. Yes. On open yeah, yes. Awesome. Okay. And then for for Vietnam and um, Tanzania, just questions for you all with with not using a central interoperability layer like OpenHIM. How are you all handling central or not central, but just logging and auditing of these transactions to monitor you know the success or failure of different syncs? Yeah, I think we need a mic. Yeah, in, in Tanzania, we actually use OpenHIM. Okay. Uh, so OpenHIM comes in the middle, all the MRs pass the data to OpenHIM. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. Joel, are you reaching out to more? <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? How do you handle logging or auditing of the different transactions? So if there is a failure or if you want to see an audit trail of the different syncs, where is that managed? You don't have a way of like, like, you know, write up it on, maybe we don't track In DHS2? How, how do you do that in DHS2? No, because the logging is like, you have the DHS to audit everything, right? So we're just looking for that one. So even the backend is just talking to DHS2 and mm -hmm. everything is happening in DHS2 full of publish. It is logging to DHS2 service. So that was the reason like the, the middleware was then created is to um, just to uh, receive the data, send the data to DHS2. And we are not generating, we are not storing any any anything outside DHS2. So everything stored inside DHS2. Okay, so I'm not as familiar with DHS2, so just to be more specific, are you relying on like system generated timestamps on individual records to see when things have been updated and then like user login records to see when someone maybe initiated a transaction? Yes, actually that's um, the, because the, the, all the transactions start locally, right? So even when the people are entering the data, we just push through one uh, particular uh, username, which is uh, middleware. Okay. So we just send to the DHS to the notifications done by the airport. So it is initiated by this one, but authenticated by three. But again, everything is stored inside the Okay, awesome. Which Thank you. Also the, the, the service itself is also not being able to do For our custom service, we also are not being able to do this. So we do have that set to log in for me over the whole process. Uh, but it's very federated with the way it works, so you should never really have a button value, you know, you should never really have a button value comes to the service. This is going through multiple levels, but if there is something wrong, yes, it is done. Yeah. Okay, just not visible necessarily yeah. in detail. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a there's a general principle somewhere behind that question. That, look, if we look at all the examples today, first of all, huge amount of variety and lots of different kinds of implementation. Um, and sometimes it's hard to see, you know, what kind of structural parts could be reused from one thing to another. Adrian, is that, is, is that you? Go ahead. Oh, okay, wait, don't go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, uh, so my question is directed to Comfort. Um, I understand you are using DHS to end fire. So my question is, how are you mapping uh, fire resources to match the DHS to context? Okay. In our, sorry, in our case, we were using the fire adapter. So I just wanted to understand how you are, you are doing it doing the like transformations and so maybe okay. Okay. okay i mean all of that is is done in afro there's a like road like python script that that does that so yeah we do that yeah 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 we would like airflow like we build like we do all the 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 mapping and yeah like in there okay I think that um, Vlad has a question. Oh, it's Vlad. oh okay. <laughs> Even though he didn't put his hand up. Uh, About ADX. Well, one no, of no, actually, no. Okay. No, um, I'll, I'll, I'll it. It. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you ask the ADX. You are the father of ADX at uh, UIO. So, you know, I think most people who are in this room have dealt with interoperability and then, you know, the moving data across. And what I've seen the, the six presentations, we are all basically creating custom solutions. And have you looked in like existing products and like we're not able to find something that would do it for you? And that's why you had to create a custom one or like what made you decide to basically come up with a custom solution? Because basically we keep on creating custom solutions and there's just no reuse a lot of times. And it's not directed to a specific team. It's like whoever wants to answer. Yeah, so for example, in our case, I would say, uh, we sort of looked on other solutions, uh, but the problem was whenever we try to integrate, it's not only us who are supposed to. It's usually somebody else. They are, they are the own vendors and they're supposed to send data to, to us. So you find that they don't know most about the technology. So it's sort of a problem to start capacity building them and all of that. So you find yourself in a situation where it's kind of infeasible, let's say. But one thing that I wanted to point out before Bob cut me out in my presentation. <laughs> You're getting his own back. Yeah, I was, see your slide and he cut me out. <laughs> yeah, with the fact that uh, the architecture that we have developed, we are actually trying to extrapolate it. And then we try, we want to try to build it on top of the, of the tool that Bob and Morton built so that to allow the fire standards and all, and all of that. And then the, idea of the main thing we want to do on our end is such that because there are so many vendors who maybe they some of them are sort of reluctant to deal with, with standards for whatever reason we want to make it simple for them to sort of possibly not even worry about the standard so much and that's why we create that mapping which is easier now for the tool that we are creating to use the standards to you know extrapolate like data to other systems that's our idea yeah, from uh, from uh, our side, there are not really many, many tools out there to serve our requirements. So as you know, making some integration during the pandemic, that's where the taxi very quick. If we develop our own solution for the data integration between the data to and the public photo, so we have a full control. So that's where then we can solve the issue uh, very quick. So, for example, uh, we are running uh, one solution and some, some issue happen, and we don't have any, uh, any control. That we need to contact the, the owner of the solution. Uh, hey, can you fix me about it? And then sometimes there will be much, much more time difference, and the issue needs to be solved immediately. So, that's one of the reasons that we want to. Try to create our own solution that we will have a tool in the Oh, okay. Maybe like I can just add so, something. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, for for us, I mean, the 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 
in the architecture, the tools that we've used are mainly open source, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's only the mediator, but if you look at the, what I was, the green part, when I was talking about the dimensional, we build that in CETAs. So, and we're using DHIS to, I mean, even the, for the web portal, I mean, we're using open source tools. I mean, we're using charts, uh, we're using leaflet and, so basically we, we are it's just open source, just using what is there. And yeah, just the mediators sometimes, you know, like, yeah, that, that would be custom, but still we're using it on an open source tool that everyone is sort of, or people are using out there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so you had two components. Yes. You had Happy Fire, and then you had two DHS twos. And the third one was the HISPA. Oh, it is yeah, the planning module. Yeah. Yes. Is that a, a app in DHS two, or is it actually a separate uh, application altogether? So what we've done with that one, we used, I mean, superset. So we we used uh, like norms, I mean, from WHO, and so yeah, like to do some calculations to say, you know, maybe in a particular area, how many, you know, professionals, or, you know, maybe nurses, or you would need to meet, you know. Uh, maybe your targets or yeah so we use superset for that I, but going forward we are still you know exploring to and then we're trying to use you know uh, machine learning we're trying to use ml flow and yeah so there's a lot of work that we're trying to do there but we didn't have enough data so but we are collecting more and yeah but that's where we are going but for now it's just we just build you know uh, it's on superset we just build like yeah, yeah, the calculations and, and that on, on superset, yeah. Okay. Guys, I know a little bit about the, the, the his Vietnam Lao thing. And I think, yeah, doing is right, in the end, it was just something that needed to be done quickly. And COVID vaccination certificates were suddenly hugely in demand. I know that it was early discussions around using open function together with DIVOC. Um, there were complications around getting them off the ground and they weren't technical, they were more sort of political. Uh, uh, and in the end, I mean, what they did, they didn't actually quite go from scratch because the European Union had produced its open source repository of how it was doing its vaccination certificates. And what they actually did well, they started off using the European Union code base and then Morton rewrote it all, <laughs> um, as he does. <laughs> but the, on the, the open NIS stuff, I'm talking about reusing open source software. Uh, we had two open MRS presentations today from Vincent and also um, Mr. Mpazi, who's still there online, I hope. And some of them referred to the old DHIS2 connector, and they were all reasonably polite, which I was very pleased to say. They said, <laughs> you know, this was pretty good, but it wasn't quite good enough for what we need, because I wrote that thing. Ten. <laughs> <laughs> but that 10 years ago in a hotel room in, in Rwanda over a weekend. Um, it was never great, but... You know, sometimes it's like that. I mean, the open source software is there. Perhaps it's not as well used as people imagine. Perhaps it's not quite as good as, as um, you need it to be. And people go off and, and, and do something else. I think what we're starting to see is more, more efforts to try to converge around, around kind of integration frameworks. And I've seen you guys, uh, uh, I've decided Apache, Apache Airflow is something that gives you structure, something to work with. Um, within our integration team, um, I don't know if anyone was at the fire talk, but more and more we're trying to encourage at least his groups who are developing, instead of doing random Python scripts to do stuff using our Apache Camel tools. And similarly, I know what the open function folk are doing, are building and enhancing their connectors for various systems, including the, the DHS2 one, uh, in a way that will allow people to easily take it up. And without being religious about choosing between this, this and that, I mean, the, 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 the fact that people are looking more towards using frameworks for interoperability, instead of just these random ad hoc throwaway scripts, 
um, is a measure, I think, that we're maturing a little bit, I hope. How much? Right. Is it working? Yeah, okay. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is actually for uh, Bob Morton and the integration team and others uh, for all of you who presented. So, uh, I mean, first of all, to the integration team, uh, now we see a lot of uh, new solutions, uh, integrations presented in this academy and this has happened even in the past. So um, uh, like, what would be the way forward? Like, is it just uh, we hear these presentations and uh, we may have few uh, community of practice posts around this innovation. So are we thinking of any integrated approach uh, uh, to disseminate these uh, innovations across the network? Because like, uh, I mean, what we see is like every time, I mean, um, so it, it could be HISP, so even other uh, organizations who keep on creating uh, their own custom solutions. Probably one may be uh, the lack of knowledge on, uh, on, on whatever that has been done. Of course, like uh, there were some justifications around uh, we having control over what we have uh, designed, uh, but that, that was more about uh, COVID than you, when, when you require very rapid uh, response. Uh, I mean, which was unusual scenario, but moving forward, what would be the uh, solution? That's number one. Number two, again, uh, is for all of you, like, uh, uh, like, most, I mean, whatever the innovations that you have designed so far, uh, is there anything, I mean, there must be like, what are the things that are preventing you from making uh, all this code base open source, if there's any, yeah, those are the two. Who is the second one there after that? All of us. You're all doing clue, no, no, but, but, but Dong is not doing Start any clue. Yours is all open source. <laughs> Sorry? First question. Yeah. First question is for me. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I suppose what we've started doing, and it's kind of it's still a little bit internal, is sort of within the HISP group. So, you know, Chatura has been involved in that as well, is trying to change the the way we have this interoperability discussion within oslo which has been a, a little bit introspective we kind of just talking to ourselves three or four people every week and we're trying to blow that right open at the moment in terms it's now sort of a weekly meeting where all the hisp groups who are working on integration projects can come together and Converge not necessarily always just around tooling, but also about about you know understanding the different patterns and the like. The way for where we see that going, uh, two things I guess. One is we've got plans. We're going to do an integration academy. That'll be exciting. We haven't done that ever. Um, but also we got to get it out of just talking to his groups. Now we've got to get bigger in terms of. Um, um, I mean, everybody's been talking about interoperability for the last couple of years, but we haven't actually. And as, as HISP, as DHIS2, what we've been doing is participating to some extent or other in other various groups and forums, Open HIE and the like. <laughs> I think what we need to do now is to maybe open up some forums ourselves and say, well, this is, this is, this is a space that we need to be talking to a much wider community on. So all that is happening, I guess, over the course of the, the year ahead. What was the other question? Oh, why are you guys not making your stuff open source? I think that was it, wasn't it? <laughs> Comfort, uh, okay. your stuff, is it open source? I don't know. Uh, I mean, all the, the tools that we are using are open source, right? But with the mediators, I mean, we have a code, I mean, uh, uh, you know, on 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 GitHub, I, I, you know, again, I think we you you try to stabilize the thing and and yeah, I think that's the thing, you know. But at the end, I mean, this would be out in the open, um, yeah, because we use trying as much as we can to use standards and and others can easily adopt. So I think that's the that's the goal. 
and and using the open source tools i think is is an enabler it's like it's tools that we are moving towards that so nothing is actually really but the data of course you know it belongs to the ministry so but but the but what we build like we stand as that we can definitely share with the community I think nothing's so stopping you're not, you're not sharing it yet. <laughs> no, it's there on on, uh, on your private repository oh, on GitHub. Yeah, it's there. Or is it open? It's still like the close thing because yeah. sometimes you're still fiddling with it. And yeah, but the, the end goal is actually to share it. Yeah, yes, yes. Nothing is actually stopping us. It's just that when you start, you know, yeah. Mm. Mm. I mean, it does, it does raise another issue. I, I, and I know, Vincent, you want to pop in on this. But um, one of the things that certainly concerned me over the last year or two is increasingly the concern around security. Yeah. Right? Some of these little integration scripts and hacks and things uh, sometimes leave a little bit to be desired. Um, Alexa has pointed out, for example, the, 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 the importance of audit, but there's also other things besides audit. Yeah. Um, because it also opens up another layer of risk as soon as you start connecting to other systems um, security is a concern which hasn't really raised much of its head until now i think it's going to very much so but vincent what are your open source plans about i care yeah yeah so what's I think, the what, what's the business model i think you <laughs> i think you're the last week with the dhs2 you know innovation lab uh, at the university we are basically open source enthusiasts. We don't like to keep things to ourselves. Uh, when it comes to the EMR, unfortunately, it's something that is still new and evolving. And some of the concerns I think Bob has said there is the issue of security. So we don't want to sort of open source it. And you know, while we haven't really considered all those, all those other aspects of security and all of that, as you know, when you're creating a new product, uh, you, you tend so much to to provide the functionality rather than looking these other what all these other aspects of security and all of that are taken care of but also there is the issue of you know what once we open source something want it to be really good nice to read you know people can actually read it and things like that so it usually goes through you know refactoring process where you have to make sure really the community can read the code can, can also contribute and things like that so for us it's just a matter of time Although I presume the, the, the tool that we said we are going to extrapolate and create it as a tool of its own, it could be fast because it's, own, it's going to carry minimal functionalities, which I think we can open source it much faster than the entire EMR, I would say. Yeah. There's another argument against open sourcing it, which might be interesting, Dung might be able to respond to. <coughs> when they did this thing in Vietnam, um, they didn't have capacity to support the whole world. Right? They just had a thing that was working for them. And the big fear about making it very public and putting apps on app hubs and things like that was that if everybody took it up, then you were going to be supporting, you know, potentially tens of tens of countries. Did you get that pressure? Were there people asking you to, to use your solution? And, and, and how did you deal with it? John, maybe you, you can answer this. Because it is open source, as far as I understand. Anybody can. Yeah, no, actually, like it's, um, it is like we had a, you were there. We presented uh, what Dung and Martin did, and he converted into GitHub because, like, Martin, what he did was to generate the QR code, right? The QR service, the signing, and the verification. What Dung did was is to how DHIS2 people can access it uh, from the tracker to a public portal. And we made um, uh, that code is already Git in GitHub. And we asked Nick, because Dung and his Vietnam team were a bit uh, not so good in documentation. So Nick wrote a, a pure good documentation on how to import it and how to install it and use it for their own DHRs too. And that was made public so mm. that like it can be used across. And we did a demo for DHRs to global team and how we can try to do it. And Dung also shared uh, the same uh, things with uh, his Pruanda with Andrew. And he was the one who created his own solution for the Rwanda base. So there is a, some kind of learning and things are happening. 
And there, what you are saying is to, if we make this whole thing public, uh, right now, a few of the solutions like the, the web portal, the signing and verification service, those are public. Mm -hmm. What is not public is the mobile solution, which we just are learning uh, how mm -hmm. to make the mobile solution for play, uh, put it in the Google Play Store and App Store. That's very specific for the country. Uh, that is what we don't know how to even make it public. Mm. So there's much more to making something public yeah. than just putting it on GitHub, right? There was a okay. they had to get people in to write documentation and 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 tidy it up perhaps to an extent that they wouldn't have done otherwise. Can I comment? Is are we still on? <laughs> Ranga, we, we we haven't muted you yet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, I'm just wondering, what is open source? Making something public, is that making it open source? Because I think there's something there. Because, you know, when you make something open source, you're now talking about maybe a little bit more than just putting your source code public. Mm. It should be accessible to a lot of people. People should, you should be able to develop the community around the products, the quality of the software. So I don't think a lot of people have actually matured enough to produce open source software. That's my comment. But some of your stuff is not open source, Ranga. I know that. Yeah, yeah because, you know, for example, we don't have enough model. <laughs> like, uh, but what, the thing about it again, the open source now or later, because a lot of people are saying we shall open source, we shall open source. But in my view, an open source project is easier if it starts out as an open source project. Yeah. yeah, instead of trying to refract a lot of things later on. Okay, that's my comment. Thanks. That's probably true. I don't know, Alexa, do you have any thoughts about that? You, you've gone through a journey of taking something and making it open source. So, so what, what are the challenges around that in terms of the business model and you know, what, what, what's difficult? Well, for us right now, we're going to... Well, you have a mic coming. I did, but I've been there's naughty boys at the back of the classroom. Um, um, hi, everyone. Alexa from Open Function. Um, so we have an integration platform that started off as a SaaS, but with an open core. And particularly over the last couple of years, especially this year, we've been taking a lot of what's in our proprietary platform and moving it over to our open source DPG. Um, so for us, the process has been interesting because there's a lot of stuff tied up in that platform, kind of as Aranga said, that it's not the best, a lot of refactoring, poor documentation, stuff that really requires like our team to, to know what's going on there. Um, but also stuff that are maybe specific to proprietary functionality like billing. Um, but for us, I, I think going open source has been a really good exercise in, in checking our work, um, making sure that, that it is readable um, and you know, trying to really think about, you know, how easy is it for someone else to pick up and to extend? And are you really setting up other contributors to success? Um, but something that we're certainly, you know, exploring and, and trying to get better at is like, how do you do that community building? Because again, it's not just making a repo public, but how do you create those forums to have these conversations, to promote your work? Um, for us, one avenue that we've, we've taken is that there's already a lot of really amazing open source communities, particularly in the digital health space. Um, so, for example, we interact a lot in the open HIE communities, and they already have standing calls regular weekly, monthly basis that lots of people go that are interested in this thing. So sometimes just by showing up in those and, and sharing your work, it's a way of, again, not duplicating forums and communities, but rather trying to cross pollinate and, and those that exist. Um, so I think for, for the DHS2 community, it'd be interesting to see, you know, like what existing academies or, or community practices can, can be leveraged to then promote open source work that individual implementations or HIST groups that are doing. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point about, about quality, I think, that, I mean, sometimes when you're going to open source something, you start to introspect a little bit and you think that it's not quite as good as we'd like it to be it's actually quite a good thing to do though because it does make you improve and i think it's also important from security perspective so if you've got horrible little scripts with all the authentication in plain text in the top of the python script you know you can live with that if it's if it's proprietary if you're going to put it on a repository then you feel a bit ashamed i hope
I think I just wanted to add a bit on the community because I think Alexa was the first person to talk about it. Um, but I think each project will need its own community because when you look at the global open source projects beyond the public health space, like the Linux project and all of that, they have their own core people within that believe in the project that commit their time to the project. So um, in addition to starting to project as an open source project from the beginning, I think you need to find your believers, people that believe in your idea outside of your organization. Um, I think I read a few years ago, is it open HIM? It started in a project and that project ended many years ago, but over time people believed in it and they continue to work on it and develop it. So I think that approach can actually help. I see a lot of the presentations on the um, integration and it's similar to what we are also doing in West Africa. And I'm, I'm laughing privately, like it would be nice to see the work others are, 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 be, are doing so that I don't have to write the connectors for 15 countries all over again. I can just take from what you have, but these communities are missing. So people are not really aware of what's happening around the world. And I think a lot of thought needs to be put into that and how to publicize them. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, this is Dr. Basharat uh, from Pakistan. Uh, yeah, uh, just a comment that uh, while we keep uh, and use uh, it as an open source uh, DHS tool, I think we should have uh, strict SOPs uh, for the uh, for the security and safety of the data, and uh, it not be like this a randomly open source we we may have the provision of data encryption uh, by the in the by the uh, the country or by the organization who is using it i think this is these are two things to be taken into consideration while make it a source uh, set so i mean sort of open source no absolutely thanks for that um and i i think if i, if I think about dhis2 for example one of the benefits that we have at this point is because we have so many people using it there are a lot of penetration tests sometimes by our friends and sometimes by people who are not our friends but they share the results with us anyway <coughs> and one of the advantages of being open is that you you do get looked at um, and that's what we want to encourage um, some of these small little scripts and things we don't know anybody has ever looked at them whether they're whether there's any quality control in the sense of what you talk about you, you need in Pakistan. But we can talk more. His Pakistan, um, who I visited just three weeks ago, was my first time ever in Pakistan. But one of the areas, the niche that they are looking at perhaps getting into, because Pakistan is a little bit complicated in terms of many different implementers, is to focus exactly on these interoperability problem. They want to position themselves as the, the integration partner. So interesting, talk to, talk to Adnan and the His Pakistan people. Two minutes, somebody's gonna have the final word. Vlad is not gonna ask it. So, so I'm gonna ask it. Okay, Vlad, ask it. The last question of the day. Oh, John. I want to ask the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I know I, Bob would probably ask it better, but so uh, we started using ADX five, six, five years ago. And, you know, when we started using it, it was basically, you know, you could send 100 records to uh, DHS2, and if you had 200, it would take an hour. Uh, and then, you know, you had 300, it would take three hours and so on. And, you know, Bob and uh, Jim Grace was not here were like very helpful, got it fixed immediately, but it's been still challenging, you know, and just how useful do you find using ADX and what were the challenges of using ADX for you know, sending data along? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, we, we, 
I think it's just something that we're starting to look into. We haven't started using it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I think it's just right now. We, I mean, uh, yeah, we're using fire, and then we just do the aggregation, and then we, we, yeah. So like we're not using. We're exploring. Yeah, seeing if there are benefits. But I think there's a lot we can learn from you guys. That yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So the my question is, or not the question is the action point. We've seen lots of uh, presentation. We need to cut it down and all. So when will be your, your integration workshop where we have three, four days where you can actually just take one example and just say you can modify this one and make it right. And more on the hands on uh, integration workshop. Yeah, we should do like four or five days proper, proper version. But I think you probably, like Morton was thinking about after Christmas because there's so many workshops coming up to Christmas. Uh, January never works, so he's probably February next year. If I'm gonna, if I was our betting man, I would say February 2023. One week integration workshop. Solve all the problems of the world. <laughs>